manuscripts don't have titles. Okay? Good Friday 1613, writing westward, does. Almost all the manuscripts have that exact thing. So it's telling us exactly when this thing is um, in this, uh, when this is written. Right. And Dunn is going to Dunn is going to in this poem play once again on that notion of sphere and intelligence. <clears throat> Let man's soul be a sphere, and then in this the intelligence that moves devotion is. And as the other spheres, by being grown subject to foreign motions, lose their own, and being by others hurried every day, scarce in a year their natural form obey. Okay, so let's unpack that. I mean, it's not the end of the sentence, but we'll stop there. So this is man's soul. And then in this, the intelligence that moves, he says is what? Devotion. Okay? Devotion is usually religiously inclined. It's, it's God inclined. It's devotion towards God. Then in this, the intelligence that moves... Devotion is, and as the other spheres, by being grown subject to or to foreign motions. Now, he might be talking about the general Ptolemaic system, in that these are the other spheres, and when this sphere moves, it has an effect on this one, and the effect of these two moving has an effect on this one. It kind of cascades. Okay? So notice... If you don't want to be moved by other spheres, which sphere is it best to be? If you had a choice in the matter, the further most one outside. Okay? But even that one is moved by God, whom Aristotle calls the prime or first mover. God himself is unmoving. God himself is in stasis, okay? So, that's possible one meaning of as the other spheres, by being grown subject to foreign motions, lose their own. But what else could the other spheres be? Well, if let man's soul be the sphere, then these other spheres can be Other men's souls. Okay. By being grown subject to foreign motions. Remember Sonnet 116 by Shakespeare? Well, let me not to the marriage of true minds and made impediments. What does he say about time and time's sickle compass? Though we come within the, he says, the orbit or sphere or circle of others, that's one sphere bumping up against another one. So what does that do? It causes the motion of this one to influence this one, the motion of this one to influence this one. Okay. Subject to foreign motions lose their own. So if these are other men's and women's spheres, and they become subject to other foreign motions, they lose their own motions. Well, what are their own motions? He's going to get to that. We haven't talked about that part yet. Okay. Lose their own in being by others. Hurried every day. Scarce in a year. Their natural form obey. So what's their natural form? The natural, the idea of the natural form of the sphere, okay, Again, it's going to come up a little bit later, but I'll give an idea of it now. It's to do what? If the sphere is the soul, not this thing, 
What's the natural form of the soul? What is the natural motion of a soul? What is the soul created, so to speak, to do? It's to rise. Why? It's to go back to that from which it came. God. Now, this is a real prevalent idea in the Middle Ages. Right? Not quite as much in Dunn's day, but Dunn loves this kind of mentality. It is all throughout, if you've ever read it, Dante, the Divine Comedy, is all about the soul ultimately doing the what? Going back to, as Dunn put it in one of the Holy Sonnets, its first state, its first seat. Okay? So... That's what it's supposed to do. But what happens? The motion of other souls kind of knocks it off track. And it loses its destination. Why? Because it is being by others hurried every day. Scarce in a year, their natural form obey. That is where they ought to aim to pleasure or business so our souls admit for their first mover and are whirled by it <clears throat> God is supposed to be the first mover God is supposed to be the thing that draws us onward St. Augustine says everyone has a God sized hole and everyone essentially tries to fill that hole with one thing or another. St. Augustine, before he became St. Augustine, before he became a Christian, tried to fill it with sex. Read his confessions. Lived a pretty raunchy life until he discovered religion, so to speak. Okay? He says people fill that hole with all kinds of things. Well, in our modern society, you know, what is one of the top problems in the United States today? Supposedly, it's the opioid addiction problem. Okay? That's something people are trying to, so to speak, fill the hole with. Okay? So you try to fill it with drugs. You try to fill it with technology. You try to fill it with clothing. You try to fill it with sex. You try to fill it with booze. You try to, whatever. Okay? Pleasure or business, Dunn says. So our souls admit for their first mover. We cross out God and we fill it with pleasure. Well, there's St. Augustine and sex. Or some business. Okay. What is this word really? It's two words. Or it's a word with a suffix. Busyness. Busyness. Sorry, God, too busy for you. Right? I mean, think about your lives right now. You have this week is your final week, full week of classes. Next week, Amberly's eyes can really be back on my God, you're kidding. <laughs> Next week, you've got a half week, and then you've got final exams. Some of you are graduating, probably. Okay? You're graduating, you're thinking. Thank God I'm out of here, et cetera, et cetera. Your life's going to go on, et cetera. Yeah, your lives are a little busy right now. You can't think about, okay, let's take God out of the equation. Other things, okay? Believe me, I hear it every semester at this time. Can I get an extension on this paper because I've got four other papers due? It happens, right? I mean, because that's what, you know. Mean, nasty professors are for it. To all those side papers that same week. That's why I tried to do them last week, but you know that my own fault didn't work out. So they take business and pleasure as the first mover of their souls. And what does he say? Business and pleasure do to the soul. I love how he chooses this verb. They are whirled by it. What does it mean to whirl something? Spin it. Okay. Think ballroom dancing, big flowing dress. What is it, you know, you don't just gently, slowly turn around. Why? 
you spin so that the outside of that dress picks up, what is it, centrifugal or centrifugal? It's one of those two. That force that makes the outside spin faster than the inside. So what do business and pleasure do? Is this a nice controlled rotation? No. It's being flung. The soul is. Right? But we haven't got to why this is Good Friday 1613 riding westward. Hence isn't. What does hence mean? From there is it that I am carried towards the west this day when my soul's form, what? Bends towards the east. My body is going this direction, westward. My soul's form does what? Turns towards the east. Why? What's the east? Well, east of London is Paris. So what does he mean by east? Louder? No. What day is it? Good Friday. What's, go oh. <laughs> What's going on? Good Friday. Christ is hanging on the cross. That's why his soul turns east. Because everywhere, religiously speaking, Christianly speaking, everywhere west of Jerusalem, in order to focus on the act of the day, faces east. Doesn't matter if you're way up north or way down south. Face east. Because what happens in the east every morning? The sun rises. The sun. And Dunn loves to pun on the two meanings of, in the two spellings of sun. So, hence is it, I am, notice, I am carried. What kind of voice is that? Passive. I am carried. Something is carrying me west. But my form does what? Bends. That's active. My soul, even though my body's going this way, my soul is what? I'm thinking back here. Okay? There, where? East. I should see a sun by rising set. S-U-N. Well, how can a S-U-N by rising set? What must every sun that rises do? It doesn't stop, right? I mean, this would be the perfect time of year to have that sun stop, you know, for, I don't know, four or five hours at 11 o'clock in the morning because you could get a whole lot done. <laughs> Believe me, I was feeling that yesterday as I was grading the papers. I mean, I probably spent all told, I don't know, 20 hours on, on these, having an extra four or five hours without the clock going would be really nice. There I should see a sun by rising set, and by that setting, endless day begin. Endless day. How so? Because usually when the sun sets, it begets what? Night. When the sun goes down, darkness comes. Well, this sun rose, and what happened? From the moment of crucifixion, if you know the story, from the no moment of crucifixion to it is finished. Darkness over the earth. And then it is finished, and the sun came back out. And by that setting, in this day be yet. But that Christ on this cross, echoes of the dream of the rude, not that Dunn knew it, he didn't. But that Christ on this cross did rise and fall. How did he fall? Dead. Okay. Sin had eternally benighted all. Unless Christ had risen on the cross and fallen as a result of it, then what would have happened? There wouldn't have been endless day. It would have been endless night. How so? Where... What would the form of souls led to if that hadn't happened? 
traditional Christian theology. Another place. Hell. Which is not a place of light and happiness and fuzzy puppies and, you know, kittens and stuff. It's hell. It's hell, okay? It's, you know, this week in the school, <laughs> writing papers and everything. Notice what else? Unless he rose and fell. Fell how? Might be, I'm not saying Dunn is doing this. This just could be my reading into it, but I don't think so. This might be also Dunn's little nod to the Christian notion of the harrowing of hell. Because what happens on the cross after it is finished and he gives up his spirit, what does Christ do? Well, the body hangs, but the body's not the me, okay? So what is the me that is Jesus doing at that point, according to the Christian idea of the harrowing of hell? Goes down to hell and does what? Saves it. Breaks the gates open. Okay? He doesn't go up and go, eh, Satan, can I get out a few people? You know, they love me. And... Goes down, breaks the gates open. Okay? Some of the early church fathers talked about this. Dante describes it in, in great detail. So that when Dante gets to the city of Dis, which is the city of hell, the gates are destroyed. Right? Some of the early church fathers say that because of that, those who are in hell are those who want to be in hell. Because it's not a prison anymore. It's like being, it's like being at a prison, but no cell doors. So you could walk out the door. <laughs> you could leave if you wanted to, but they don't want to. George Bernard Shaw said, Hell is where you will have to do what you want to do for eternity. What you want, to, it's all about the me. It's all narcissistic, okay? Anyways, Dunn goes on. Unless he'd risen and fallen, sin it eternally, but not at all. Yet dare I almost be glad. I do not see that spectacle of too much weight for me. Now, spectacle is kind of a particular term. He probably means spectacle in kind of the theater term. For example, in Greco-Roman literature, Greco-Roman drama, in Oedipus the King, when Oedipus gouges out his eyes, that is a spectacle. So it occurs off stage. When um, his wife, Yocasta, kills herself, happens off stage. Why? That is not the kind of imitation that should be seen. What a far cry we've gone from there, right? Because now we have Saw 85, where, you know, multiple bodies, or et cetera, et cetera. This spectacle, he says, is of too much weight. He doesn't mean weight. He means gravity. Too serious for me. Who sees God's face, that is self-life, must die. God is self-life. What? What does he mean? What did God tell Moses when Moses said, yeah, okay, okay, I get what you want me to do. But they're gonna they're they're gonna need proof. What kind of proof does Moses say? The Israelites are going to need, and Pharaoh is going to need. They're going to say, who sent me? In other words, give me your business card, God, and what does it say on it? I am. Tell them I am sent you. Self-life. Okay? Everything else is not I am. It's I depend. D from Pin, hang. What's it hang from? I am, the being. Okay? So, who sees God's face, that is self-life, must die. Why? Because that's exactly, that's exactly what God told Moses. You can't see my face and live. Here's what we'll do, Moses. 
You go hide in that little cleft in the rock. I'll put my hand when I walk by you, and I'll let you see my backside. That's it. You can see that and live. So, you see God's face, you die. What a death were it then to see God die. Why? Because Christ is the God-man. Fully God, fully man. Not just mostly God, not just partly God, not just a little teeny bit of God, not just, you know, became God at some point, like Arius taught in the early 4th century, and John Milton apparently believed, but fully God of fully God according to the creed. Okay? What a death were it then to see God die. So if it's death to see God's face living, how much more death would it be? Okay, so what's he doing here? What's he creating for us? Mental image. Because what do you now have in your mind? You have an image of Christ hanging on the cross, right? And what happens when that face that is breathing at one moment is not breathing at another? If one says, as the centurion said, this was truly the Son of God. It made his own lieutenant. What's the it? Seeing God die. Made his own lieutenant nature shrink it made his footstool the earth is the footstool of the Lord Psalms says crack earthquake it shook and the sun <clears throat> wink went out for three hours not went out but it was dark because if it went out for three hours we wouldn't be here um, could I behold those hands which span the poles the poles of the cross arm, but then Dunn's going to take another image of it and say, span the poles of the Antipodes, south, north. And you've got, you know, you've probably seen that great image done by William Blake of the Ancient of Days measuring the world, and he's got a set of a compass. And you've got the round ball, and the Ancient of Days is, is kind of lying over it, and he's got his compass, and he's measuring the world. Could I behold those hands which span the poles and tune all spheres at once, pierced with those holes? Because God is up here and is the prime mover. He's the one who tunes these spheres, which is why, if you could hear the music of the spheres, boom, you'd be ravished out of your earthly body, and you'd be there in the presence of God. Could I see those hands, what? With the holes in them. Could I behold that endless height which is zenith to us and to our antipodes, humbled below us? That greatest height? He's talking about God out here, beyond the farthest sphere. That's why it's zenith. It's the highest point, which did becomes what? Humbled. Because what happens after he dies? The body gets taken down. Talk about humbled. Or that blood, which is the seat of all our souls. The seat there means is the origin. It's the source of all our souls. If not of his, make dirt of dust. Or that, drawing a distinction, dirt is moist dust. Dust is dry. Dirt is moist. Okay? So, the body's hanging on the cross and blood is dripping down. Make dirt of dust, or that flesh which was worn by God for his apparel, ragged and torn. God put on flesh. That's what incarnate literally means. If on these things I durst not look, well, why does he durst not look? Well, one reason is what? He's writing westwards. 
He's not physically turning and facing the cross, so to speak. So if on these things I durst not look, why else does he durst not look? Go back to line 7. What a death were it then to see God die. I, 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 I can't bear to look. Um, if on these things I durst not look, durst I upon his miserable mother cast mine eye, who was God's partner here, and furnished thus half of that sacrifice which ransomed us. Okay, so I can't look at Jesus hanging out there on the cross. What about Mary? Now, most Protestants don't think about Mary at all because Mary doesn't figure into Protestant theology at all. She's, she's not important other than giving birth to him, and, and pretty much that's it, okay? Dunn, former Catholic, now Anglican. Anglicans still talk about saints, okay? So he says, okay, so I can't look at Jesus, but can I look at Mary? Because what is Mary doing there? Yeah. Morning, to put it mildly. Because Mary, like his other disciples, all thought what? Okay, what else though? Son of David. Messiah, chosen one. I mean, what was Mary literally told by Gabriel? He will be the son of the Most High. He will be an everlasting king. This is the son of God. So, okay, son of God. <clears throat> but they nailed him to a cross. How does that work out? <laughs> it seems like you would have any hope. Yeah. yeah. They didn't have any hope. This is why in the gospel account, after the crucifixion, what do all the disciples do? Well, first of all, none of them are at the crucifixion but one, John, and Mary, and the other Marys. Okay? But what do the rest of the disciples do later on that evening and over that weekend? They're hiding. That's why they're all in the upper room. They're hiding. They're afraid. I mean, if they're going to get him, they're going to come get us too. And what happens? You know, he appears to them in the upper room, etc. It says, don't be afraid. So, upon his miserable mother, cast mine eye, who was God's partner here, furnished us half of that sacrifice. What half of the sacrifice did Mary furnish? Keep going. Flesh. It's the incarnate part. God gave second person of the Trinity part. She gave this part. Why? According to St. Athanasius the Great, God became man so that man might become God. God became man, <clears throat> took on human flesh so that human flesh could be raised, could be divinized, so that human res, human flesh can be lifted up. Why? Because you know one of the one of the wise men came to Jesus, and they asked him a question, and Jesus said, "Okay, I'll answer your question if you answer this question. How is it that David can call his son Lord?" And they're like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to answer your question. And then he says another thing. How don't you realize? Because he says, you know, you are gods. And they're like, well, I, we're men. How can we be gods? Don't you know the law and the prophets? What does Psalm say? You are gods, the psalmist says. So Jesus just turns the words the scribes and Pharisees supposedly know back on them. Half of that sacrifice which ransomed us. Though these things as I ride westward be from mine eye. Why? Because I'm facing over here. Why? Because business or pleasure or something else is whirling me. They are present yet unto my memory. Because he was there no. Unto uh, his memory, how? He's read about it. He's heard about it. 
and read things you read about, they come, become planted in your memory. This is a kind of meditative exercise. St. Ignatius of Loyola, okay, founder of the Jesuit order, the same guy that Dunn wrote a little polemical tract called St. Ignatius' Conclave, where he put St. Ignatius and the Jesuits in hell. They're the ones who started, you know, the Spanish Inquisition, the Jesuits, okay? St. Ignatius came up with these spiritual exercises. And what you did in the spiritual exercises is you imagined a spiritual event. Okay? And so what do you do? You conjure that image in your mind. Christ on the cross. You see that image. You picture it entirely. And then what? You apply your will to that image. That is, okay, here's the image, it's real, so what does it mean to me? And then you go live. Well, we've already talked about this. Roughly 500 to 800 years before Ignatius. That's the dream of the root. The dreamer has a vision of the cross, the cross speaks to him, and the cross tells him what? Now remember this image and what? Go tell others. Okay? So these images are present yet unto my memory, that for that looks towards them. Physically I'm riding away. My mind, however, looks toward the cross. And thou looks towards me. This is where it gets tricky. Not Tricky, you know, hard to understand. Tricky, done, brings it down to the very, very personal. Thou, who's the thou? Christ, where? Hanging on the cross. <gasps> Dying. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's really dry. <laughs> Makes it more realistic. Yeah, really. <clears throat> <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> I've got chronic laryngitis to be uh, chronic tonsillitis to begin with. That wasn't smart. <clears throat> and thou looks towards me, O Savior, as thou hangst upon the tree. I turn my back to you. What does turning your back to somebody indicate? Abandonment. That's why you know the most prominent blessing in the Old Testament is what? May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. It's when God turns us back to you. Bad stuff's going to happen. Okay? And you get that, you know, throughout the history of the Old Testament. The Jews fall away. God turns his back. It's when he turns his face, he brings them back, etc. I turn my back to thee. Uh, but here's why. I'm not abandoning you. I turn my back to you. Why? To receive corrections. In other words, scourge me as you were scourged. Till thy mercies bid thee flee. Break, batter, blow, he says in Batter My Heart, Three Person God. For how long? Until your mercies bid you to stop. Mercies gets translated. The word that is used in, in the Hebrew and the Greek, whether you're talking about the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek translation called the Septuagint of it, gets trans the word in either the Hebrew or the Greek gets translated either mercy in the King James, which had not been, yeah, had been published then, 1611, or gets translated loving kindness. For your loving kindness endures forever. Same thing. Beat me until your loving kindness bids you stop. In other words, until I'm done. Pun intended. Oh, think me worth thine anger. Punish me. 
Okay, now what does that imply? Think me worth thine anger. What is the speaker suggesting? That God punishes people to like correct them. Okay. Doesn't like the Bible say like you discipline and you do well? Yeah. Think me worth thine anger. The speaker is suggesting something about the one whose anger the speaker wants to receive. The speaker doubts. The speaker doubts that God thinks him worthy of correction. Okay? Think me worth thine anger. Punish me. Burn off my rusts and my deformity. Restore thine image so much by thy grace that thou mayst know me and what will happen. And then I'll turn my face. Okay? This is an entirely Protestant idea. Because Dunn is saying, I can't do anything at all unless God first gives me the ability to do it. For example, John Milton's Paradise Lost. In Paradise Lost, you have Satan and his henchmen, his crew, his posse, if you want. They're all um, chained down to the lake of fire. And Satan's face is like, you know, this. It's like in Young Frankenstein when King Wilder gets caught in the bookcases. Put the hand on breath. Satan's face is pushed down into the lake of burning fire. And he can't do anything. And we're told, meanwhile, back in heaven, God looks down at Satan and gets a little smile. And the little smile allows Satan to kind of go, just lift up a little bit off the lake. And that's when he starts rousing his troops. And if you read Milton's Paradise Lost, there's something wrong with you if you don't get to book three and he reads Satan give his rousing, you know, Henry V St. Crispin's Day speech and think, wow, what a leader. This is the kind of guy I could follow into hell, you know, <laughs> and beyond kind of a thing. Okay? Which is why um, William Blake said Milton was secretly of the party of Satan. That Milton secretly had a thing for Satan. He really liked Satan. It's like, no, not really. There's other reasons for that. The point is, Satan can't do anything until God allows him to. Well, it's, that idea is in the book of Job. What happens in the book of Job? Job's a wonderful, righteous person. Lots of kids, lots of stuff. And we find out every now and then, the sons of God have to come before God. Well, who are the sons of God? Angelic beings. Both good angelic beings and fallen angelic. Even Satan has to come and go, yeah, 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 I've been walking around tempting people. <laughs> I got Savannah really good the other day. And God says, okay, take a look at Job. He brings Job to Satan's attention. Why? Because he's angry at Job? Nope. No. He knows what Job's going to do. He knows what Job's going to do. Because he programmed Job that way. Predestined, no. The thing we talked about a long time ago, God's eye, eyeball, perspective, everything, single point of time kind of a thing. Okay? This is done saying, Unless you do all this stuff, unless you restore me, I can't do a thing. Okay? Restore thine image, burn off my rust, my deformity. He's getting partially, I think, in here. Uh, idea of human depravity. Not incest and bestiality and all that kind of depravity. But like the all of sin variety. The, the Calvinistic depravity. Totally depraved. Every aspect of our being is touched by sin. That kind of depravity. So Dunn's, Dunn's essentially saying, I can't turn around God. 
Unless you do what? Unless you reach down and enable me to. All right? It done, apparently, based upon letters, based upon his sermons and such, done really wrestled with doubt of his salvation. Never really quite knew. For example, let's look at Meditation 17, and then we might come back to look at the hymn to God the Father. Meditation 17 is written at the same time as the hymn to God the Father. Okay? So Meditation 17 is one of, um, let's mention how many, yeah, 23 meditations Dunn wrote in the winter of 1623-24. He got sick, he thought he was dying. It's page 940 and 41. Thought he was dying. So he writes this book called um, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. Emergent, like emerging. Well, what would the emerging being from? Death here to life there. Okay. And so there are 23 of these. And the structure of these is... You have a Latin phrase, an English translation, a long meditation, and then there's also usually a long prayer. Okay? You don't get the prayer you hear. You get the long meditation. So, nunc lento sonitu dicunt morieris. Now this bell tolling softly for another says to me, thou must die. So why is there a bell tolling softly? It's English custom. This goes way back. In England, traditionally, let's say you're, out, you're in a small village. Somebody in the village is deathly ill. When the people in the village suddenly hear, boom, boom, and they hear a bell ring, <clears throat> eight times, pause, they know a woman has died. Eight times for a woman, nine times for a man. Okay? So it would ring, there would be a pause, and then it would ring again. And it would ring for the number of years the person lived. So, five-year-old Freddie dies in a farming accident. You hear nine bells, and then five. If you're not expecting nine five-year-old Freddie to die, that comes as a surprise that some five-year-old in the village has died. Now, imagine you're in London, and the plague hits. <laughs> the bells are ringing like crazy all the time. Because people are dying left and right. Okay, So, Dunn is lying in his bed near St. Paul's, and he hears this bell tolling. The bell is probably almost constantly tolling. And he writes, Perchance he for whom this bell tolls may be so ill is that he knows not it tolls for him. That is, maybe there's some guy who is literally on his deathbed and they've already started ringing the bell. You know, cue the mighty pipe. I'm not dead yet, you know. <laughs> And perchance, I may think myself so much better than I am, as that they who are about me and see my state may have caused it to be told for me. So he first says, maybe there's some other poor slob who's on death's door, and it's ringing. And maybe it's me that it's ringing for. The church is Catholic. And he restates what Catholic means. <laughs> Universal. Catholic doesn't mean that one over there in Rome. That's capitalized and prefaced with Roman Catholic. Catholic simply means universal. So what does that mean? It touches everybody in the church. The church is Catholic, universal. So are all her actions. All that she does belongs to all. Does it mean all that she does belongs to everybody in every place at all times? 
No, it only applies to those within the church. But what he's suggesting here is when someone is baptized into the church, that person what? Becomes part of me. Why? Because I am a part of that church of which Christ is the head. So look, you know, we're going to add a little, another skin cell, so to speak. So, when she baptizes a child, that action concerns me. Why? For that child is thereby connected to that body, which is my head too. And engrafted into that body whereof I am a member. And when she buries a man, that action concerns me. Notice the two images, birth, death. Okay. That action concerns me. All mankind, notice, all, not just Christians, all mankind is of one author and is one volume. When one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book. I just love this language, my God. But translated into a better language. Think about that. Someone you know dies. They've just been translated into a better language. A more beautiful or beautiful language. And every chapter must be so translated. Now there he kind of implies. Christian, not Christian, doesn't matter. All chapters have got to be translated. Translated into what? What kind of language? The heavenly language. Every chapter must be so translated. Why? God employs several translators. Okay, so what's he mean by translators? Gunshot. Not the method of choice in London these days. That's stabbing. What else? Sickness. Sickness. Age. You know, the wanderer. Spear. <laughs> Fire. Water. Done. Chance. Fate. Kings. War. Poppy. Charms. Some pieces are translated by age, some by sickness, some by war, some by justice. But God's hand is in every translation, and his hand shall bind up all our scattered leaves again for that library where every book shall lie open to one another. Now notice what he's just said because it deals with the quote-unquote problem of pain. Every death. He's asserted as what? Or who is involved in every death? God. God. Nothing. Nobody dies. Done is asserting to God by accident. Nobody dies with God going, oops, shoot. I wasn't watching him. <laughs> Didn't mean for that to happen yet. And his hand shall do what? Bind up all our scattered leaves. Each individual is a leaf in the book. And we're scattered. How so? Because some die in London, some die in Cambridge, some die in Bristol, some die in Washington, some die in Murfreesboro, some die in Uzbekistan, some and all these pages, all these leaves from, it's implied, the beginning of time all the way to the end of time will be scattered up again for that library where every book shall do what? I just love this. Lie open to one another. What does that mean? Lie open to one another. Dunn says in ecstasy, um, the thing about, you know, love and such, but our bodies are our books. Okay. Open to one another means, what's the difference between this and 
this. Bingo. This is a closed book. Can you know anything that is in this book? Go ahead. No, you can't. But if it's like this, you've heard some so and so is an open book. That means they use another phrase. Wear their heart on their sleeves. Okay. Easily readable. In heaven, he says, we will all be what? Completely open to one another. As therefore, go back to the bell, the bell that rings to a sermon calls not upon the preacher only. Again, English custom. This is also a custom in you know, Greek churches. They have this thing called a semantron, where somebody comes out, bangs a piece of wood or a bell to tell people, they do this several times, to tell people, we're getting ready to start church. Get a move on. You get like a 30-minute bell, a 20-minute bell, a 10-minute bell. You're running out of time. And each time, you know, the ringing of the bell speeds up a little bit. He's saying the ringing of the church bell doesn't only tell the minister, I better hurry. It tells the parishioners, time to go. So this bell, which bell? The bell tolling softly outside his window that perchance may be for some poor slob who doesn't yet know he's dying or me, this bell does what? Calls us all. Calls us how? It is a memento mori. It's a reminder of death. It's why Hamlet Holds your skull. This too shall be me. That's why he meditates on the mud. Could could this actually be Alexander the Great? Could Alexander have stopped a bunghole in a beer keg? But how much more me? Why? Because I'm sick and I'm nearly dead. There was a contention as far as a suit in which both piety and dignity, religion and estimation were mingled. Which of the religious orders should ring to prayers first in the morning? Okay. He says, this contention got so serious that a suit was brought. The Dominicans are, we want to do it, Francis. No, we're going to do it. You know, Carmelites, no, we're going to. And it was determined that they should ring first their rose earliest. Hello, duh. <laughs> Common sense, you yeah. If we understand aright the dignity of this bell, that is, the significance, the symbolism of this bell, that tolls for our evening prayer. Ah, so now he's saying, this is a bell telling people, come to Vespers. We would be glad to make it ours by rising early. It's evening prayer. He says, if we understood the significance of it, we would be glad to make it ours by rising early. He means like six in the morning. Why? To prepare. To get ready. We would be glad to make it ours by rising early. In that application, what? That it be, might be ours as well as his the guy nearly dead, whose indeed it is. So notice, he goes back and forth. Is the bell ringing for somebody who's nearly dead? Is the bell ringing somebody to go to church? Is the bell ringing to remind us all that we die? Multiple choice answer? Yes. <laughs> it's D, it's all of the above. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. Got a guy at church, teaches here. Chemist drives me crazy because whenever he reads the word doth, he pronounces it doth. The bell doth roll for him that thinks it doth. Okay, it's a doth. And though it intermit again, stop for a moment. That's what it means by intermit. Yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God. What? If you hear the bell tolling, 
and you think it's tolling for you, Dunn says, what does that do? Unites you with God. If, and only if, it's this. <laughs> if it makes you think of your own coming death, who casts not up his eye from a comet when that breaks out? We don't have too many of those. Who bends not his ear to any bell? One of these ringing in class. Okay. When that breaks out, happens every semester. Somebody doesn't turn their phone off. They come into class 30 minutes in. It rings and all eyes burp, go on that person. Okay. That's what he's talking about. So if your eye is drawn to a comet or your ear is drawn to the sound of a bell, who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? Why? Because every man is a part of me and I am a part of every man and woman. No man is an island entire of itself. Yeah, Simon and Garfunkel <laughs> stole this, being the highly literate songwriters that they were, or that Paul Simon was. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent. What's the continent? And the I-T-Y, humanity. Humanity is the large thing. We are all part of that. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. How much less is Europe? A little teeny tiny bit, but it's still a little bit less. What's his point? Every man's death diminishes me. And I think, and I cannot prove this, but I think... Um, Charles Dickens was familiar with this because when he wrote A Christmas Carol, this had to be in his mind. Because when the ghosts come and Jacob Marley says, mankind was my business. He's echoing this. Any man's death diminishes me. Why? Because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, Hemingway, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for me. Never sin. Never ask somebody, go find out who that bell is tolling for. Why? You hear, you hear the bell tolling? Do what? Apply it to yourself. Say, it's a reminder, I too will die. Why? Because I could walk out this room in five minutes and there could be some crazy maniacal moron out there who shoot me. Happens every year. It's disgusting, right? We don't know when that time comes. So Dunn is saying, you hear that jingle? <laughs> Apply it. Remember. Neither can we call this a begging of misery. Because some people would still look at that and go, Man, what a morbid SOB. I mean, he's just looking for death everywhere. No, Dunn says. Why not? Nor is it a borrowing of misery. As though we were not miserable enough of ourselves, but must fetch in more from the next house <laughs> in taking upon us the misery of our neighbors. As if life isn't bad enough already. I've got to go borrow it from Amber Lee, you know. No. No man hath affliction enough. No. You can't go up to somebody who's suffering from cancer and say, you don't have affliction enough because you're not being matured and ripened by it. No man hath affliction enough that is not matured and ripened by it. This is what Dunn says is the purpose of pain. It's for what? Maturing and ripening. So what do you do when you become mature? You merely age no. till you become a doddering old fool? No, you reach your pinnacle. 
Ripening means you reach the best. That's what he's saying affliction, pain does. And made fit for God by that affliction. If a man carry treasure in bullion or in a wedge of gold, or let's update that, bitcoins, <laughs> and have none coined into current money, his treasure will not defray him as he travels, right? Go to Kroger with Bitcoin. See how far it's going to get you. Go to Kroger with a bar of gold. I don't know about you, but if I were the checkout you know, person at Kroger, I'd say, sure, you can pay with that. <laughs> Buy whatever you want. And then I'd you know, immediately quit and be on the lamp. If a man carry treasure in bullion or a wedge of gold, having a coin into current money, his treasure will not defray him as he travels. Tribulation is treasure in the nature of it. That is, in its essence, it's like what? Raw gold. Not gold coined into currency. But it is not current money in the use of it. Except we get nearer and nearer our home heaven by it. Another man may be sick too. And sick to death. And this affliction may lie in his bowels as gold in a mine and be of no use to him. Why not? If gold stays in the mine, what good is it? Well, we're back at the wanderer, right? What good does it do to strew your brother's grave with gold? Is that gold going to buy him anything? No. No. So what does the wanderer, Beowulf the seafarer, and all that great old literature say to do with gold? Share it. Distribute it. I had a doctoral student write about almsgiving in the Exeter book. The manuscript that has the wander and the seafarer. Her argument was almost all the poems in there are kind of a manual for a future prince to do what? Give alms. This is how you become a good king. All right? Done. But this bell that tells me of his affliction, and I think he's possibly using two meanings for the word tells. Tells speaks to me of his affliction and tells like a bank teller. Counts it out. Does what? Digs out and applies that gold to me. If by this consideration of another's danger, I take mine own into contemplation and so secure myself by making my recourse to my God who is our only security. What is that last line of the wanderer? You want stability, security? Seek for it in heaven. All right? So what's done? Done. Takes the ringing of the bell, maybe to go to church, Maybe sit because somebody else is dying and says, the bell tells me what? Be ready to die. Be ready when? All the time. All the time. Okay. Real briefly. 15 minutes. Hymn to God the Father on 939. Dunn also wrote this poem when he was ill. Okay. Had it set to music, and he had it sung to him. And he had the choir of St. Paul's sing it after he was well. Okay, so this was used in church. And he puns on his own name. This is the first thing I'd ever read of Dunn, and this is what got me interested. I mean, I just, I read this as an undergraduate student, I thought, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty witty how he does that. Wilt thou forgive that sin where I begun, which is my sin, though it were done before? No. There's a lot going on just in those two lines. He's talking about original sin. He's talking about his original first sin, his past. And he's also saying, but it's not only my sin, because others have done it before. Wilt thou forgive that sin where I begun, which is my sin, though it were done before, where I begun? In sin did my mother conceive me. David says in Psalm 50. Okay? So that's begun, which is my sin. Why? Because I've done it. Okay? 
Wilt thou forgive those sins through which I run? Huh. And do them still. Okay? Though still I do deplore. And there he's echoing St. Paul. I do the thing I don't want to do. I don't do the thing I do want to do. And he prays three times. Remove this thorn. God says no. When thou hast done, what does he mean? When you have forgiven those sins, thou hast not done. Punning. When you have forgiven those sins, you still don't have me, D-O-N-N-E. And some of the manuscripts do read D-O-N-N-E. Why? Because I have more. In other words, okay, God, you can forgive all that stuff, but guess what? I've sinned again. This was the problem that caused Martin Luther to nail the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg. Augustinian monk, pretty severe. He would go to his confessor. He would confess his sins. He would leave. He would get almost outside the church, and he would sin up here. He'd turn around, go back up. And he came to a conclusion, I can't do confession. Why? Because I'm always sinning. I'll be forever in the confessional. Okay? Luther thought. Stanza two. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I have won others to sin? Oh, so this goes beyond just me. This is now, you know, St. Paul says, don't lead others into sin. So you're going to forgive that one too? And made my sin their door. Their door what? Pleasure palace or, you know, whatever. Wilt thou forgive that sin which I did shun or a year or two? That is, you know, I was pretty good. I put that sin away. But wallowed in a score. What is that verb wallowed? Usually, where is it usually used? Like, For like, whom or what? Pigs yeah. do what? They wallow, wallow in mud. They wallow in mud. That imagery is like in the prodigal son too. Okay. It's very much in the prodigal son. It often implies sexual sin. Okay. So I was I was pretty good. I stayed away from it a year or two, but wallowed. I mean, just thoroughly reveled in it. For how long? A score. 20 years. When thou hast done, thou hast not done. For I have more. Okay, you forget. Okay, you forget all. Okay, I still have more sins, God. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I'd love to hear Joe Pesci do this. You know, okay, 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 okay. I have a sin of fear. That when I have spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. What's the shore? Jordan. It's this side. What's that side? The promised land. Where does Moses perish? This side. Where do all the Israelites who were born and came out of Egypt perish? This side. Those who were born during the 40 years wilderness crossover. I fear I will perish on the shore. Okay, God, so swear by yourself. Why? Because you can't swear by anything greater. I swear by God. <laughs> that at my death thy son, pun, shall shine as he shines now in heretofore. Heretofore will hereafter. And having done that, Thou hast done. Thou hast done. You hast. Have. It's not past. It's present tense. You have done. You have what? To tell us that. You have finished it. It is completed. When Jesus said that on the cross, he didn't mean, oh, thank God. I finally get to die. He means, I've done what I came to do. Everything's fulfilled. Thou hast done. Why? Because if you do this, then, if you shine as you shine now, when I am there in my last thread, what? I have no more. I have no more what? Last dying breath. No more sin. 
I have no more sins. Why? Because I don't have enough time <laughs> to sin anymore. Notice the doubt there. What's he? What's the speaker saying? The only reason he doesn't have any more sins is because like time ran out and he didn't exactly. have more sins. But if you had more time, you probably would be doing some other exactly. things. Exactly. So shine then, God, as you shine now. You gotta keep shining up until that very moment. Keep keep doing what? Keep forgiving. Keep forgiving. Keep forgiving. Why? Because I'm fallen. We go back to that sin or I be done. Right? All right, we'll stop there. We got a few more minutes, but we'll stop. Um, okay, so I will post.